Now, how many of y'all actually call yourselves abolitionists? A good number. Some of you might still call yourself pro-lifers, and, and I'm, I'm cool with that, and I'm happy you're here. This talk's mainly for you, and, um, and, uh, and, I, and I hope to persuade you that there's, there's nothing to be lost in connecting ourselves to the earlier cause of the abolitionist movement. But back when I first started giving these lectures, if I got up and said, I'm here to talk about abolition, people just naturally thought slavery. But now, if you say abolition, do you know what people naturally think? Abortion. Like, that's changed. But I used to always have to begin this talk saying, like, we're going to talk about abolition. What is abolition? You're thinking slavery. You're thinking the abolition of the slave trade. You're thinking about William Wilberforce, the British parliamentary uh, fight to abolish the slave trade. Or you're thinking about the battle against, uh, you know, chattel slavery in America, the buying and selling of human beings. But yes, that I will be talking about that. But more importantly, I want to talk about abolitionists. Why did they do what they did then? Why do we do what we do now? Look at abolitionists in the knowledge, you know, that there have been great heroes. You probably recognize some of these, uh, Harriet Tubman, Wilberforce, Garrison, Douglas, Clarkson. They are famous and they're loved in history and celebrated. We got museums and they end up on our money and all this, and they're, they're, they're highly celebrated. But in their time, they were branded as madmen, fanatics, heretics, dangerous disturbers of the peace um, and we persecuted them as a country as a culture um, and now we celebrate them today as though we would have been like them in the past but why did they do the work of abolition why were they abolitionists and it's quite simple I think we all know abolitionism is not first point I want to make it's not wedded to the particular evil Abolition is not just about slavery. It can be about any particular evil. Every age has its evils. Every age has its abolitionists. But why? Where does it come from? Well, abolitionists, they hold to abolitionism. It's a doctrine. It's an ideology. It's a, it's a worldview. It's an application. And where does that come from? So moving rather fast. The first guy who wrote the first history of the abolition of the slave trade was a, was a brother by the name of Thomas Clarkson. Wrote this fantastic book. This is volume one of the history of the rise, progress, and accomplishment of the abolition of the African slave trade by British Parliament. They had really great titles of their books uh, back in the day. And uh, another cool thing about their books is the chapters would always have like, this is the stuff that's, like if you ever read an old book, it's like the chapters will be like, this is the stuff that's in this chapter. Opening chapter, all these things, and his argument of his opening chapter in that book is abolitionism is when evils are removed by Christianity. Okay? Thomas Clarkson says there's something particular about the religion of Christ that leads to the removal of evils. And the reason he writes the book is he wants people to understand why they did what they did, what motivated them, what they learned, so that, as he writes in the, in the final words of his opening chapter, so that people can contemplate their work and fight other evils in the future. So abolitionism just kind of basically defined as the removal of evils, um, and it's never been the removal of a particular evil. We all know very famously William Wilberforce, when, after he stood up, you know, this guy, he was, he was in British Parliament. He's kind of a playboy, gambler, not a man following Christ. Christ got a hold of him. He remained in politics. Uh, he talked to the writer of Amazing Grace that we, that we sung, and John Newton and others said, you must remain in politics for your neighbor. And God just did a work in Wilberforce's life, and he became feelingly alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures. And if that makes him a fanatic, well, I'm, I'm a fanatic at large. And so Wilberforce, when he finally did see the abolition of the slave trade, which was his life's work, so it goes, they came up to him and they said, congratulations, this is great. You've, you've accomplished what you're doing. And Wilberforce is 
response wasn't, all right, slavery's been abolished, we're good, abolition over. It was, what do we abolish next? What do we abolish next? Which means abolitionism is not wed just to slavery. So it's the endeavor to remove evils. It's an ism, but where does that ism come from? Well, let's look at William Wilberforce himself. At the height of the campaign to abolish the slave trade, Wilberforce writes a book. And what does he write a book on? Like why slaves are people, uh, why the slave's life begins at a certain period, something, no. He writes a book called A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians in the higher and middle classes in this country contrasted with real Christianity. From his letters, from his speeches, from his diary, we see that what Wilberforce believed was the reason that we have the slave trade is because our hearts are cold towards our brothers. And if we do not love those who we have seen, how can we claim to love God in whose image they are made? So he set himself to the task of writing a book on real Christianity. Real Christianity. Because if you have real Christianity, you have abolitionism. So to convert the culture to abolitionism, you have to convert the culture to Christianity. It's a very good book. I suggest you read it. We're not going to talk too much about it. But he sets it up as there's this kind of Christianity that's go to church, do these things, sing these songs, believe these propositions. And then there's a kind of Christian Christianity that's biblical. And that is a Christianity that is in conflict with evils. It's in contrast to what's being practiced. So you read the whole book, you get to the bottom of it. Abolitionism is contrasting Christianity, according to the most famous abolitionist in history, Mr. Wilberforce. Now, that jumped across the pond, and I'd love to talk about all the different figures, but Britain has their William and we have our William. And William Lloyd Garrison, who kind of took up the cause in America, similarly defined abolitionism as nothing but Christianity in a culture that enslaves uh, uh, <laughs> African uh, descent people. And he said that abolitionism is removing evils, but it's also refusing to go with the multitude to do or allow grave equal evils. That we not only don't have anything to do with evils, but we expose them and we attempt to remove them. Now, where did he get this from? Where did Garrison get this ism from? Well, it's straight from the Bible, straight from the Word of God. You look at Exodus 23, 2, you shall not follow the masters in doing evil, you shall, nor shall you testify in the dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Christians following the law of God don't go with the multitude to do evil. They don't turn aside. They don't take the other side of the road. They lay down their lives for their neighbors. So in the 1830s, and there were abolitionists in America prior to this, but beginning very clearly, historians kind of mark the birth of the abolitionist movement in America in the 1830s with William Lloyd Garrison publishing The Liberator and standing up in the culture saying, yes, we've been saying slavery's bad, but the diagnosis is that our nation, this is William Lloyd Garrison in 1831, our nation is full of the blood of innocent men, women, and babies, full of adultery and concupiscence, full of blasphemy, darkness, and woeful rebellion against God, full of wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. He stands up and he's not calling for social justice, he's calling for national repentance because we are in rebellion against God. This is why he doesn't go on to do anything else with his life. He devotes himself to being this sort of uh, street preaching, pamphlet publishing, wild-eyed fanatic who says crazy things like this. But where does that come from? Well, that though poetic and, and certainly strong, actually has its origin in the prophet Isaiah. He's literally repeating what the prophet Isaiah said to his people, a sinful nation laden with iniquity. 
They have forsaken the Lord. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even to the head. There's no soundness in it, but wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. And the prophet goes on to say what we must do, and that is to wash ourselves, make ourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Abolitionism is simply Isaiah 1, 16 through 17 ism. Totally biblical doctrine. What do Christians do in cultures where there's oppression, where there's evil? Well, they cease to do evil, learn to do good, and they bring justice to the fatherless. So abolitionism pops up, and, and, I, and I always put Douglas up here, because Douglas may be actually more famous and appreciated than William Lloyd Garrison, but this rhetoric, this call for repentance, this call to the country to understand that they were in rebellion to God is not just on the lips of Garrison. It's not just on the lips of like a, a William Wilberforce. It's across the board among the abolitionist leaders. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I, I suggest that you, I read this every 4th of July. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Frederick Douglass addressing the, na the nation says it, uh, you know, blatantly. Uh, Garrison didn't always attribute this really cool thing I just said. I, I stole it from the Bible. Um, he just kind of said it, knowing that it would not return void. Douglass stands up, he says, in the language of Isaiah, you know, our hands are full of blood. When what do we need to do? Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless. So what was their evil? And why did these abolitionists rise? Well, they live in a culture, we all now basically agree that measuring up people and seeing them as property is, uh, is a fra fragrant, viol flagrant violation of their rights as humans and image bearers. But in their culture, that's what was buying and selling of people. Auctioning off children, auctioning off parents from the children, separating husbands and wives, destroying the family, day in, day out, happening in the South and in the North, various areas, all under the covering of unjust laws, the whipping, the maiming, the rape, the destruction of people of African descent. And this was going on in a country like Isaiah's that practiced religion. So religious people, more people went to church at that time than go to church today, and in a country of laws and belief in right, and so all of this is going on, and it's been going on for you know, 30, 40 years, and the abolitionists come on the scene, and they're moved to compassion to stand up, and why? Because they begin, ignore that, we'll get back to it, they begin to look at the issue from the position of the golden rule. What would I want done for me if I were in their place? And so abolitionists begin working on the Underground Railroad, trying to help as many people. They say, the only rule, there's only one rule of the, the Underground Railroad, because it was legal. The only rule we follow is the golden rule. So they looked at the African slave and they said, he is a brother, he is a man, he's recipient of the same principles of Christianity. And it was that desire to love their neighbor as themselves that led them to be abolitionists. So you look, do unto others as you would have done unto them. And they often, fittingly, said, we need to rescue those who are being taken away to death. Um, there was a great organization back in the uh, 19th century called Rescue Those. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But it's a great name for an organization. But that's what they saw themselves doing. Now, um, in a longer paper, I could go in and look at more and more people. But I love this quote from William Goodell. He says, He's a, he's a preacher, he's talking to people who are, he's trying, he's like a Brett Baggett. He's trying to get his people to love God. Come then and help us restore to these millions whose eyes have been bored out by slavery, their sight, that they may see to read the Bible. Do you love God whom you have not seen? Then manifest that love by restoring to your brother whom you have seen his rightful inheritance of which he has been so wrong and so cruelly deprived. 
This is what drove Goodell. That was, that was William Goodell. Here is Beriah Green, who uh, became an abolitionist in Oneida College and began preaching and teaching abolitionism from his pulpit and also in his courses at the seminary. He said, I cannot escape it, this conviction that our Savior has presented to us in the case of our colored brethren in the 25th of Matthew. 25th of Matthew is whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And pointed them, the slave, as his appropriate representatives. And when we're called to give an account for not relieving these poor brethren, the plea of ignorance will be of little avail. So again, Bariah Green begins preaching this. It leads to the foundation of abolitionist societies. They start getting together. They start writing doctrines. They go before their churches to pass resolutions. And they come to it from biblical Christianity. They say the only proper remedy for the sin of slaveholding must be found in the immediate, full, heartfelt respect of those rights in the invasion of which the monstrous crime consists. Every slave ought immediately and unconditionally to be emancipated. Why? Because that's what we would want done for us. So that's where the abolitionist societies came from. That's what the rank and file. As historians note, this is just a um, professor. Uh, the attack on slavery was formulated in religious terms and from the first to the last, practicing Christians provided leadership for the cause. That, that needs to be known. The first clergymen to respond in large numbers to the abolitionist appeals in 1834 were not antinomians, they were not pietists, they were, ad, they were not advocates of the social gospel, but old-fashioned, well-established New Englanders with strong orthodox leanings. Our culture is awash with um, discussions of the abolitionist where people want to make them secular or make them heretics because they don't want to admit the revisionist historians uh, that are secular don't want to admit that the people who led the abolition of slavery movement were Christians, hardcore Orthodox Christians. They don't want to admit that because we all think slavery is fine today, uh, bad today, and we don't want to say the heroes are the church. On the other side, people who are part of the church that did not rise up with the abolitionists want to deprive the movement of being led by Christians and have said that all these abolitionists were heretics and Unitarians. And um, it's just not the case. They, there, there are a few that here and there, but by and large, what we saw is the church of the living God rise up for their neighbors. What put them at odds with so many people is that they had this thing called the Church Repent Project. And um, yeah, I love that that always gets laughs. It's like, oh, that's funny, but that's sad. The conversion of the churches to the cause of immediate emancipation was the earliest and most persistently pursued goal of the American abolition movement. And why was that? Because the church is the only thing on the planet that possesses the gospel, the power, the motivation, and the ability to remove evils. As Clarkson has said, Christianity removes evil. So we have to wake up the church. The church waking up the church to this evil. All going on in the midst of the church. So it led to um, this sort of thing. Attention, Southern men, down with the abolition press. Meet at Schneider's. I bet you Schneider's was in a very friendly place. But we have to put these fanatics down. We have to destroy their printing presses. We have to destroy their, their meeting places. Uh, we have to go from town to town saying all manner of evil things about them and pursue them to their very lives. Um, just as Christ said would happen to his followers in Matthew chapter 23. Their meetings were ransacked. They were not just um, mocked and, you know, opposed uh, in their words, but people actually opposed them. Garrison was hunted down in the streets. They mobbed him. They tried to tar and feather him. He had to be sometimes put in prison for his own protection. One of the times he was in his prison and he, and he wrote on the wall, I'm here for simply trying to love my neighbor. But the culture in the face of this, in the abolitionist cause, was not largely on board. Violence was meted out against the abolitionist for decades. 
And the abolitionists kept going. So who were these, this, and, I, and I bring this big book here. I just, I, it, that just looks impressive, like I read this big book. But I bring this big book, I, I wanted to read this because it's such a funny, funny thing. Uh, the, 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 previous, the previous slide here, this is uh, on, on the Senate floor, an abolitionist who's saying we should listen to the petitions against slavery and a southern gentleman uh, beats him near death on the floor. Well, who, who sent these petitions? Who, who's doing this? William Miller writes, who signed the petitions that so exasperated James Henry Hammond? Who were the ignorant, infatuated barbarians? Make this a little bigger whose right to petition Slade presumed to defend? Who were these foul murderers, bloodhounds, incendiaries, agitators, instigators of midnight murder, these disturbers of our peace and enemies of our lives and liberties, these cold-hearted, base, malignant libelers and calumniators, these knowing accessories to murder, robbery, rape, and infanticide? Who were these? In short, who are these fiends of hell? Church women, mostly. Church women and preachers and Quakers and a few teachers and lawyers and journalists, a powerless and marginal handful of practitioners of a new sort of reform. I see a lot of church women here, some preachers. Wait, do we have any Quakers here? Uh, okay, I'll be the Quaker. A few teachers, lawyers, journalists, powerless, marginal. Like the, the culture is freaking out because this mustard seed of people is standing up and demanding justice for the slave. So William Lloyd Garrison, this is in 1862, says he's being called to account. He's being blamed for the war. He says, who are you? Why are you doing what you're doing? He says, we profess to be Christians. Christianity, its object is to redeem, not to enslave. Christ is our redeemer. I believe in him. He leads the anti-slavery cause and always has led it. The gospel is the gospel of freedom, and any man claiming to be a Christian and to have within him the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, and yet dares to hold his fellow man in bondage as a mere piece of perishable property, is recreant to all the principles and obligations of Christianity. Now, when Garrison said this in his culture, um, it, was not, it was not well received. The difference uh, between the abolitionist ideology of the 1830s and earlier sort of anti-slavery thought is that these guys came on the scene saying slavery is sin, particularly chattel slavery is sin. Holding people as mere property, perishable pieces of property is sin, always and everywhere and only a sin. And saying this and preaching this and teaching that we have to cut down we need to cease to do evil, learn to do good, and all manners of evils that come from it is what they set themselves to do. And the response was not, we're going we're gonna to go with you. And this is where this lecture is going to eventually end. The response was not, we're, we're with you. The response was, you are teaching the doctrine of demons. This is a pictorial, this is a cartoon of William Lloyd Garrison getting the idea that slavery is a national sin from Satan. I found his response to this particular accusation. He says, for myself, I know that it is my meat and drink to do the will of my heavenly Father. My joy is that I'm a partaker of Christ's sufferings. My happiness is to be reproached for the name of Christ. My life is to be always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. My reputation is to be ranked among madmen, fanatics, and incendiaries. My pleasure is in infirmities, in reproaches, necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. The things of this world, its pursuits, its honors, its emulations, its fortunes, its reputations, I tread under my feet. The overthrow of Satan's empire and the triumphant establishment of the Redeemer's kingdom on earth are what I earnestly desire and seek. It's the leader of the abolitionist cause. So Garrison believed that anything that the gospel seemed, it seemed to be contrary to the gospel ought to be immediately abandoned. Any treatment of our neighbor as property ought to be seen as sin and repented of it. And this is the driving force. The standard was Christ. The fanaticism was to make, you can read this whole thing in the video later, I'm not going to read it all because there's so much to read, but the, the point was to make Christianity the enemy of all that is sinful. This is the driving force 
force of the abolitionists of slavery. And it's awesome. On the masthead of the Liberator, any of you guys watch the Liberator podcast? Just, just sweet, good, makes me feel good. Um, it used to be a paper, and they you had to like print it and distribute it and charge people. Um, and the masthead, of course, towards the end was to put. Sorry for those of y'all who don't who think that's a second commandment violation, but to put Christ between the slaveholder and the slave, and to see him coming to break the bonds of the oppressed. And what do you see? Love thy neighbor. The masthead. This is our ideology. This is our drive. This is our message. So what does all this have to do with abortion? Why all this historical stuff? The first thing I want to make sure you understand is that our connection to the abolitionists of slavery is nothing to be ashamed of. Connecting yourself to the people who opposed the abolitionists of slavery is everything to be ashamed of. And lying about your brothers in past is something you should not do. But, okay, but it has to go deeper. It isn't merely slavery's bad, I gotta love my neighbor. There's more to abolitionism than that, right? When you start from the perspective it's sin, and when you start from the perspective of, I'm trying to love my neighbor and answer the question, what does Christianity look like in a culture that kills or that enslaves human beings on the basis of their descent? Um, how do we deal with that? Slavery and abortion are different things. Don't ever stand up or put on Facebook or make an analogy saying that slavery and abortion are the same thing. Certainly don't say that that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying slavery and abortion are the same thing. But I am saying that there are similarities in those things. They're both grave evils predicated on the dehumanization and dominion of man. They both deny the image of God in man. They both deny the incarnation of Christ in man. They're dehumanizing. They're dominating. They're, they're evil. They're both like, they both share in that category. They both share in the category of being practiced under the covering of unjust laws and decrees. So those are similarities between slavery and abortion, even though they are One's enslaving people as chattel, and the other is murdering them as parasites. But different evils, they are the same in these, in these ways. There's also the fact that when slavery um, in, the, in the 19th century was being practiced, the vast majority of people, believers, unbelievers alike, churchgoers and non-churchgoers, the vast majority of people believed that the right to own slavery was constitutional. There were things written in the Constitution that kind of explicitly were pro-slavery, but could certainly be construed to protect slavery. And today, a majority of people living believe that the right to terminate humans in the womb, even if they don't like it and wouldn't do it themselves, is constitutional. The Supreme Court has said it's constitutional, so we need them to unsay that it's constitutional. But right now, if you listen to pro-life leaders and teachers, abortion is constitutional. Another similarity is, is, of course, during the campaign to abolish slavery, there were different approaches, different strategies, different tactics. I was talking to a young lady uh, in, the, in the room over there uh, before this talk, you know, is, is the difference between you and Doug Wilson one of um, different approaches, or is it someone's in sin or not in sin? Um, people believe back in the days of slavery, there are different ways of dealing with this evil. And today, people believe there are different ways of dealing with this evil. And so on that ground, I would say that what we need to be asking is, okay, there are different ways of dealing with this evil, but what is the biblical way of dealing with this evil? What's the way that Jesus, say he led the, abol say Jesus led the abolitionist cause today, like Garrison said he led the abolitionist cause yesterday, what would be the way? What would be the right approach? So, Anti-slavery at the day, there were, there were lots of different theories, but the two main categories, the two ways of dealing with slavery among people who thought that it was wrong um, can really be summed up between like the gradualist and the abolitionist. The gradualist believes slavery was wrong um, and it should be gradually abolished. Like it's a bad thing, we need to get rid of it, but we gotta get rid of it gradually. As they're committed to that. If we got rid of it overnight, which we can't really do, but if we did that, it would be turmoil. It would, it, would, it, would be, it would be bad for this or that reason. They were committed to the idea of removing it gradually. 
They're also committed to the idea that the emancipation would be voluntary and compensated. So they focused a lot on encouraging people to sort of like choose manumission. Like slaveholders should be encouraged to choose to voluntarily free their slaves and they should be compensated for their loss because we don't want them to be victims of this. And the focus of the gradualists in advocating these things, their day in day out focus, was really on amelioration, like amelioration as in making life better for the slaves and colonization sort of, if they're not gonna be slaves, they need to be like adopt, they need to be sent to a different country. So let's make it easier, better for them, and get them out of our country in the meantime while we work on gradual abolition. So that was the, I would say, historians kind of say that is the primary view of northern churchmen aside from the abolitionists. Now what the abolitionists believed, they believed, yes, slavery is wrong, but as I said before, they believe slavery is sin. Calling something wrong and calling something sin might seem synonymous to you, but when you start calling it sin, you start proposing biblical answers to it, not secular answers. And sin in the Bible, if you look at what Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. This is some very severe, quick, immediate responses. The Bible says justice needs to be meted out quickly, speedily. If not, the hearts of the evil men will run to do evil. So calling slavery sin meant that it should be immediately abolished. It should not be gradually abolished because the Bible does not tell us to gradually abolish things. None of the prophets stood up and went before kings and said, let's tear down some of the high places where children are being sacrificed to Moloch. It's like tear them all down now. And if you don't, you're in rebellion to God. So they took a biblical view and it led to immediate abolition. And with immediate emancipation, they did not believe that it should just be voluntary and compensated, but that it should be compulsory and uncompensated. They thought correct oppression for those oppressed and established justice for those who are being unjustly treated. Don't treat the slaveholder as a victim. He's not a victim, he's a victimizer. You're not gonna compensate him. Set up a law. Some of this should start ringing in your ears, know what I'm talking about. And their focus in the meantime, while they were calling for total and immediate abolition, their focus was to help slaves to freedom in defiance of federal law. Like it was a, an illegal criminal act to help a fugitive slave. It was against the Constitution, it was against the Supreme Court, and every Christian working in the Underground Railroad knew that and believed that they were obeying God instead of man, and that man was not allowing them to love their neighbors as they loved themselves. So while they called for immediate abolition, they also tried to save as many as they could by working the Underground Railroad and by persuading and preaching and teaching, so on and so forth. So these were the, those are the two big ways. Now, slavery as sin ends up in their doctrines, in their resolutions, being something like, well, as far as sin, we preach go and sin no more. Um, we say there's, there's forgiveness for the sin of slavery but that doesn't mean it should be legal. It should be criminal. So abolitionists were very clear. They weren't just calling for an end to slavery. Uh, they were calling for it to be criminalized. It should be prohibited by law. And that, it should have a total, immediate, real world punishment because that's what governing authorities are supposed to do was what really distinguished the abolitionists from the gradualists. And it's what distinguishes us today. You know where I'm going. So slavery is criminal. You look at their, this is from the Declaration of Sentiments, 1833. Every American citizen who retains a human being in, vo in involuntary bondage is a man stealer. That's the, that's, that's Moses' word. That's in the law of God. Man stealing is a capital crime. Because man stealing is a capital crime, it should be a capital crime in our culture. Because slavery is a crime, the slaves ought to be instantly set free, brought under the protection of law. Equal protection for all people. That's what we're calling for. It's criminal. Man stealing is a capital crime. 
That's the big, big difference between the abolitionists and the gradualists. And I would say that means the abolitionists are actually anti-slavery. They are truly anti-slavery because they don't just say that slavery is wrong. They say that keeping it around and fighting it gradually is wrong. They regard it as delusive, cruel, dangerous, any scheme of expatriation which pretends to aid either directly or indirectly in the emancipation of the slaves. Like anything out there that's saying it's helping them that is being put forward as a substitute for immediate and total abolition of slavery is wrong. And they were emphatic, like they were being criticized. You guys spend more time arguing against the gradualists than you do against the slaveholders. That was, a, that was frequent charge against the liberator. People look at the liberator and they're like, okay, I know you hate slavery, but you argue more against the pro-lifers than you do. I mean, you argue more against the, the you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the, the pro-lifers um, than you do the slaveholders. Because why? They're delusive, they're cruel, and they're dangerous. Because these things are not what I would want done for me. It's a substitute. You need to do justice. You need to love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. So the only property, proper remedy being immediate, unconditional emancipation. So the gradualist, on the other hand, when, you, when it turns out and you look at it, they said slavery is wrong and that they were for its gradual abolition. But really, what they were the entire time was anti-abolition. This isn't my analysis. This is the analysis of the historical, the historians, okay? You look at it, that gradualist and the abolitionists come down. Gradualists were calling for things that were put in the place of abolition the entire time, and abolitionists were calling for abolitionists the entire time. Okay, so this is gonna look pretty darn clear to you guys. Y'all are all smart, and we've been abolitionists for a while. But I love this quote, when we look at it, a significant number of Americans, this is in 1830, underwent a kind of moral conversion. This is the kind of moral conversion I think we want you, you pro-lifers that are here, to kind of see and undergo with us. The, the, the idea that slavery was wrong, many had been saying, and they've been saying that for years, but that its wrongness had the highest priority, and that the ways its wrongness had been opposed, gradualism, voluntary manumission, compensated emancipation, the way that it had been opposed had been profoundly inadequate. So these, the essence of the agenda which these potential martyrs in the cause, these fanatics, those fiends of hell, went out to face a hostile country was not only the immediate end of the sin of slavery, but also the rejection of the American colonization society. Uh, the pro-life movement at that time was called the American Colonization Society. It was the, the overarching, sort of the national right to life group at the time. So they set out not just to say slavery is wrong, but the way you've been fighting it is wrong. Now James McPherson, he's the Pulitzer Prize winning historian. I'm just, I just put him up here so you, you understand that I'm, I'm actually getting kind of worn down. You probably see it on Facebook. You say, man, Russell, we're worried about you. I'm getting worn down because all these people don't realize that, this is gonna, this is gonna sound just a tad arrogant for a second, I'm sorry. A lot of these people don't realize sometimes when I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm saying it because I've read like hundreds of books on it. But they'll still get on the internet and Facebook and they'll say, you're misrepresenting it. Abolitionists are all across the board different kinds. No, it's not, it's, that's not how it was. This is right on the Wikipedia page. One, who before the Civil War had agitated for the immediate, unconditional, total abolition of slavery in the United States. That was who an abolitionist was, right? There were abolitionists, there were gradualists. People want to fuzzy the line and say, we're all abolitionists. No, coming from the biblical doctrines, treating it as sin, you come to the conclusion, total and immediate, unconditional abolition. So today, let's look today. Oh, wait, sorry. Abolitionists never call evil good, good evil, never do any evil that good may come, never compromise with evil. This flows from biblical Christianity. The gradualists said slavery isn't sin. Abolitionists are evil. Um, you know, they're too mean, they're too harsh. Uh, they're, they're not, they, we all have different theories. Let's just all work together. You guys are criticizing us too much. We must allow slavery for a time in order to accomplish gradual, peaceful emancipation. Um, and compromise is key. 
clear, distinct groups here. So that was anti-slavery. Now let's look at today, anti-abortion today. No one calls themselves a smash mouth gradualist because the gradualists were the bad guys in history. So we've invented a new term called incrementalist. Incrementalists argue that abortion is wrong and they focus on incrementally banning it. They believe that eventual abolition should be the call, but right now we need to help people choose life. And in the meantime, while we work on incremental bans and incrementalism, we will focus on assistance and adoption. I'm not saying assistance and adoption are wrong, but there's a historical analogy. The focus on colonization, the focus on amelioration. I'm not going to call for justice and how dare you say I'm wrong because look, I'm adopting. Look, I, I do crisis pregnancy work. We see that today uh, among the incrementalist. Abolitionists, the people running this conference, the, the organizations involved in this conference, believe that not only is abortion wrong, it's criminal. It should be prohibited by law. It should be immediate. They should be immediately protected. And the protection should be compulsory and uncompensated. You should not be encouraged to choose life. You should not have the right to choose murder. It's illegal. And we focus on establishing justice, just as the abolitionists of slavery did. But in the meantime, as they help slaves to freedom and defiance of federal law, we don't have it as bad. But in the meantime, we attempt to rescue those being taken away to death. We go to the places where they're slaughtering children. This is an uncomfortable slide for me and it should be for you because we are not allowed to protect preborn babies the way we would want to be protected. But we do what we can uh, it's a very difficult situation. I'm not going to give a talk on what we ought to do at the abortion clinics. I believe that someone is doing that tomorrow. But we do. We try to save as many as we can. And you can work to save as many as you can while advocating for the criminalization of abortion and immediate equal protection for the preborn. So as the abolitionists said slavery is criminal, we say the same thing. Every American citizen who destroys a human being in the womb is a murderer. Shouldn't shy away from that. Because abortion is a crime, preborn humans ought to be afforded equal right and brought under the protection of law. This slide was written in 2011. That's from our 2011 thing on the evil abolish human abortion website. Abortion is criminal. We also, like the abolitionists of slavery, thought gradualism is wrong. We think incrementalism is wrong. Why? Because we regard as delusive, cruel, and dangerous any pro-life scheme which pretends to work either directly or indirectly in the abolition of abortion. Anything that acts as a substitute for the immediate and total abolition of abortion. Why? Because if you were the preborn child, you would want immediate protection. You would not want to be protected after a certain point or when you possessed a certain characteristic, so on and so forth. So we track pretty much the same. Now say we are truly anti-abortion, and the incrementalists are truly anti-abolition. You say, oh, okay, foil hat, you're being unjust. I literally was accosted last night. You know on Facebook you can like, if someone's messaging you, you can just push the button and like call them? You shouldn't do that, it's dumb. Someone was telling, it, the opening sentence was something like, hey brother, as a brother I'm gonna come to you in, in, in private before I publicly say bad things about you. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then there was a whole lot of messages, so I was like, ah, I'm about to drive, I'll just call him. I called him and I listened, and this guy just bashed me because he's like, I'm a pro-lifer, I was at the Supreme Court, we are not idolaters of the Supreme Court, we're not this, we're not this, we're not this, we're not this. What do you think about Senate Bill 13? Well, you know, I, I, I support it. Did you, you know? And he's just like accosting me, and I had to tell him, I said, listen, I'm not making this up. He says, you're making it all up. 
Pro-lifers aren't bad. We're not doing anything. We're, we're not who you say we are. I said, okay, I live in Oklahoma. You know that? And he says, yes, I know you live in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, our pro, we have our governors, pro-life. Our Senate is dominated by pro-lifers. Our House of Representatives is dominated by pro-lifers. Our population is a majority pro-lifers. We put forward bills of abolition. What do the pro-lifers do? Kill it. I am not telling a lie. I'm telling the truth about them and exposing them, and they're all very angry. And because of that, I don't sleep as much as I should. So, but anyway, they are, when it comes down to it, on paper, not just the rantings and ravings of a lunatic, they are anti-abolition. They kill our bills, they work against us, and in the place of those bills, they put forward uh, various incremental schemes so they can have victories and have parties and wine and cheese and all that kind of stuff. So they're anti-abolition, we're anti-abortion. Okay, so what's happened here? Well, William Lee Miller, you can take, and this is why I kind of have these books sitting here. I'm not going to read from them really, but, but you look through these books and you're like, I only have to change one word. I only have to change one phrase. Exactly what they're saying about them, they could say about us. As William Lee Miller said about the slavery, you look at it today. The essence of the agenda which they set out to do was not only slavery was sin, but to reject the American Colonization Society. Well, the essence of the ag agenda with which we've set out is not only the rejection of the sin of abortion, but also the rejection of the pro-life establishment. We have not been appreciated for that point. But why do we do that? It's because that is the thing that people are doing instead of abolition. So today, as James McPherson defined them then, today we define it as well. One who, you know, before the Civil War had agitated for immediate, unconditional, total abolition of slavery in the United States. Why? It's all been black and paper color until this point. One who before the Civil War agitated for abolition. Those are the abolitionists. Minority. Throughout this period, 3% of the northern population adopts the ideology of abolitionism. Very small number. Despite the efforts, this is John McKibbigan, who has written a book, basically the book that you should read if you want to look at the, um, the abolition movement and their, the, the involvement of abolitionists and church folks. Despite the efforts of thousands of anti-slavery men and women, both inside and outside of the churches, all but a few small denominations balked at a commitment to uncompromised abolitionist principles and programs. As a result, civil war and government coercion not moral suasion and church discipline, became the instrument that finally ended slavery in 1865. This is a secular historian who's written a book documenting this says, the abolitionists stood up calling for national repentance of the sin of slavery inside the churches, outside of the churches, and the people, the United States of America, by and large, said no rejected it. So instead of moral suasion, instead of repentance, we had, and instead of church discipline, we had war. Did the abolitionists cause the war? No. The incrementalists did. Time in, time out, day in, day out, publication, speech, preach. The abolitionists say, we must repent. We are in rebellion against God. And they say, why don't we do this gradual thing? Why don't we do this thing? Why don't we do that? It's got to be compensated. They're victims, so on and so forth. And they did that instead of repent. And after 30 years of that, the Lord said, we are ending slavery in this country. And like all wars before and all wars after, ordained by our sovereign God in 1865, slavery ended after a brutal, wicked war, violence, brothers killing their fathers, brothers killing each other. And that's how we dealt with slavery in this country instead of repentance. 
And we're dealing with it to this day. All this stuff that we're dealing with race relations. And this is why I am an agitator. This is why I'm agitated. This is why I talk loud and this is why I talk long. Sorry, I don't know how long I've talked. But this, because this is what I believe. We must stand up in the culture and preach what Isaiah preached. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. God does not hear our prayers. He does not accept our worship. He does not like what we're doing. He wants us to establish justice. That is our message, not increments. And so they followed Isaiah, and we followed Isaiah. We're doing the same thing for our neighbors, out of a love for them and for God in whose image they are made. And hopefully, it will not be met with war, but actual repentance.